My name is Karen Roy and I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, so the story, the interesting part, I guess, and um, I was shot in an armed robbery when I was 19. Beginning of my sophomore year, just minding our own business, my boyfriend and I had gone out to this blues place after an LSU game and he played guitar and played that night there and we were going to get in our cars and um, we were, my car had been broken into so we were kind of looking at that and some kids with guns came up from behind us. Um, I got shot in the back point blank as like a result of sort of like a shuffle that happened. Um, so. So T10, complete paraplegic, uh, lost eight units of blood and was lucky to survive. So crazy way to start your college career. and it was um, a high-grade urethelial cancer that he caught early. So I'm a wheelchair user, a manual wheelchair user for 35 years as a result. So I finished my undergrad in psychology, got a master's in social work. They um, got married, not to him, but everybody asks me that. But my husband, when I was in grad school and he um, was getting his engineering degree. And so I had a nine month old when I started grad school. Um, and then, um, so I became a licensed clinical social worker, worked in hospitals for 20 years. Um, I now work for a company called New Motion or the largest supplier of custom wheelchairs. So I still sort of, use my social work degree in trying to help people with disabilities. Like, so because of my paralysis, I have to do an intermittent catheterization. So in order to empty my bladder, I have to use a catheter like five times a day. And that's just something that I don't even think much about, pretty routine, um, but can cause infections and that kind of thing. So, um, and then there are the catheters that we use kind of unbeknownst to me at the time and then unbeknownst to a lot of people now, there are plastics softeners in catheters that have DEHP in them. And that is a, carcin a known carcinogen. So, you know, it's a combination of a foreign object being repeatedly and in, going in and out of your bladder and then the, the, the infections. But, um, there, you know, I'm working now and advocating to get DEHP um, and other carcinogens out of catheters because we need to be able to eliminate that. But so I had a kidney stone. I had several kidney stones. It was February of like, I guess about a year, two years ago that I had like a cluster of kidney stones that in, I ended up in the hospital. One was obstructing. Um, and then I had to go to the hospital and have it removed. Well, once I healed from that down the road, he said, there's some other stones in there that we're going to have to deal with. So I don't know, fast forward, like six months later, he went and did lipotripsy so where they like use sound waves to hammer those stones from the outside of your body um, and that it failed um, because he said I moved. So he said, I'm going to have to go in in a few months and, and put a scope in. I'm going to have to go in with a tool and cut these stones up and pull them out. I don't want what happened last time to happen again where it obstructs and you could go septic. So I wasn't having I was having a lot of UTIs, but you when you intermittent cath, you do any, you kind of do, right? So that was not a big major warning sign. I didn't have blood or anything yet. So he went in with that camera to remove a kidney stone. And when he did, he saw the tumor and it was um, a high grade urethelial cancer that he caught early, stage one. I remember when he, he told my mom and I after the removing the kidney stone that he thought it probably was. And when I went in, to the office. I remember the nurse wasn't coming to get me. She was coming to get the patient before me, but I could tell the way she looked at me like very empathetically. I was like, I'm, okay, I have a cancer. Um, and so I felt like I knew before even the words came out of his mouth, but I guess when he said high grade, I was like, 
you know, I, I don't know. I, I was like, God, it, if I had to have it, low grade would have been better. I just had all kinds of probably stupid thoughts where you, I didn't cry. I have been through a lot. My husband died in 2016 and I raised teenagers by myself. And, you know, I've always worked. There's been, you know, a lot. My daughter had cancer as a kid. My mom went through cancer treatment. So um, I kind of know how to roll with the punches when it comes to bad news. But um, I was kind of in a fog. Uh, I started doing my research right away. Being a social worker, I found in which is the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. I learned a ton from them and decided to start. I love my doctor here, but MD Anderson had blue light cystoscopy and some other, um, I thought some other um, avenues if if the BCG failed. Um, and also BCG is the, for this type of cancer, it's an immunotherapy. It's actually the tuberculosis vaccine and it's the most effective treatment and I was afraid that there there's a shortage that um I might not be able to get it in Baton Rouge so I started going to MD Anderson for the beginning part of treatment there's still a shortage but I haven't had any trouble getting it so um you know at MD Anderson they were actually splitting doses though because the data was showing that a smaller amount was almost exactly the same efficacy so you had to wait for two other patients to get to MD Anderson to split a dose now. And it was very difficult driving back and forth to MD Anderson. And honestly, my doctor and I weren't really seeing eye to eye at MD Anderson. So that was one thing I wanted to kind of mention is advocacy as a social worker has always been important to me to advocate for other people. And then I knew the importance of advocating for myself, even when you're at a cancer center of excellence. My doctor is very was world is world renowned, and he's you know got student, fellow uh, student doctors following him around. But um, when it came down to the, I was getting the BCG treatment, going back and forth, five hour drive when you're getting BCG or any kind of chemotherapy or immunotherapy is excruciating. Um, I got a cytology report back about six to nine months into treatment where it said that I, the cancer was back and that it had, it was a high grade urothelial cancer with squamous cell changes. And that's not good news. I, I found that out on my chart. No one called me. I couldn't get my doctor on the phone. He would, I would leave messages and he would have his PA call back every time, even though I specifically requested to speak to him. Um, the next time I, I, he was gonna put off another biopsy for like four months because of some scheduling problem of his. And I was like, highly unacceptable, like absolutely not waiting. Sorry. Um, and then, so I get the appointment moved up and, and I wanted to speak with them. I'm like, basically like, if this is true and we biopsy today and or tomorrow and find out that, that it is a squamous cell change, it's like, what are the next steps? And he basically said, well, you'll need to have your bladder removed. And I was like, well, from what I've read, and I think advocating for yourself is doing tons of research on your own. Um, that's not the next step there. There could be other next steps. And I'm a young, I'm 54, but I was in a 53 at the time. Um, usually I think the average age is like 75 year old males, right. That get bladder cancer. So I was like, yeah, I'm not ready to have organs ripped out. Like, I mean, I feel that just felt like cancer kindergarten. I was like, so no, I didn't drive all the way here for, for that. I'm sure they yank an organ out anywhere. I, but I was like, so he said, well, there are two other patients of mine that didn't have their bladder removed when I recommended it. And, and I gave them a certain chemo and they're both dead. And I was like, well, from chemo? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, anyway. And then at some point he said, I was like, well, what does bladder removal look like? What? And he's like, well, you'll have to cath. Well, heads up. I've been capping for 35 years. And if you didn't read my chart, he didn't want to come in to talk to me at all. But since he didn't look at my chart, I was, I had, was already kind of done with him. But as soon as he said that, I was like, I mean, the biopsy was scheduled. We had the biopsy. It ended up not being, it was a false positive. So gave me, but I never went back to MD Anderson after that. Well, when I got shot at 19, I realized that like doctors are not omnipotent. They're not, you know, some of them, most of them start off with great intentions. 
Um, but they don't know everything. And I learned that really fast b- b- being thrown into the medical world at such a young age. So my, yes, there are many brilliant physicians out there and I admire them for persisting through medical school and all that, but they don't, every doctor doesn't know everything. And if you don't now also in grad school, I learned how to about statistics and how to read a study and to look for biases in those studies. Like if the study is done by a a radiation oncology department, they may have a bias towards radiation. Like you have to look at the study, look who did it, and you have to find, you know, as much information as you can. I wanted to know what the the best, like what was the most effective course of treatment according to the data. I also wanted to know like if this fails, then what's next? Like what other options exist? And that, you know, that obviously served me well um, down the road. But um, I want to know who the best physicians are in the country. Like, can I get there? Can I afford to, where could I stay um, to get a second opinion? I, I also got, it was made very clear to me through the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network that second opinions, like a good doctor is never offended by a second or a third opinion. Go straight to your type of cancer and you find the advocacy network that's like most popular because they are armed with a ton of information and they have, you can find a mentor, you can find, you know, physicians that that's their specialty and they have articles and information. And I mean, that's how I found out about um, the BCG shortage and what the standard of care was for a high grade urothelial non-invasive bladder cancer was, you know? So I would go straight to one of those advocacy networks and, um, and, and ask a bunch of questions. <laughs> I went back to my doctor here. He was trained at the Mayo Clinic and um, he leads the urology department here. Now they didn't have the blue light cystoscopy, but as I kind of went on, I was like, you know what, that um, may not be the most important thing here. I think at this point, treatment options are, you know, somebody caring about me and actually knowing me. Okay. He knows me and his nurse knows me. And if I have to speak to Dr. McCall or there's a bad lab result, Dr. McCall's calling me and he knows I cast. You don't have to go to the, the cancer center of excellence. There are physicians trained from those facilities that have all the same protocols and maybe more, maybe they're willing to do more. I've been going through BCG. I'm still going through BCG. Um, like the first round was six weeks in a row. So I went every week for six weeks to Houston and then you wait three months and then you've got, you know, a treatment once a week for three weeks. Um, very, very often that, you know, I work full time. Um, and so I've got a lot of responsibility. I think that social workers are the plethora of information and if they don't have it, they will find it. Um, whether that's like, so that's how I kind of find out everything that was available and where, um, because the hotel, you know, people donate money and there are programs out there, but you have to, they're not, no one's going to present you with a welcome packet that says, here are all of the things we have to offer. Uh, It takes a little digging. So I reached out to the MD Anderson social worker and I found out there were programs that helped with hotel and, um, and or mileage. um, And so lodging and mileage and things like that. So, um, but it does get expensive and especially if you're like missing some work but now I'm to the point where like I have every six months I get scoped and then I get another round of treatment yeah so I've got coming up another a scope and another round of treatment but I feel like it's mostly in the rearview mirror yeah so I try not to put my whole like life on hold you know during the treatment um, and tried to incorporate as many fun things as my body could handle. Um, again, I think one of the best things was friends I hadn't seen in 15, 10, 15 years, um, went like, I put it on Facebook, right. And, um, and people reached out in the kindest ways and were like, I'm not working right now. Do you want to ride, you know, we need to ride with you or drive. And so I said, yes, you know, I'm not, and I'm not one to take a bunch of help. I'm pretty stubbornly independent um but I was like yeah you know what you want to go because I don't know if I'm going to feel terrible on that ride home and I need to get back to work um I was in a fairly new I had met my now fiance um at the like in June before the October of diagnosis and we were in a long distance relationship he lives in Arlington Tennessee and I'm in Baton Rouge and so that kind of 
I mean, we incorporated MD Anderson into our like date dating life. And now on the other side of it, I can look back and say like, you, you see how many people really love you, you know, that you don't slow down normally to appreciate so much of being diagnosed and hearing that you have cancer is such a mental strain. Um, it's sort of, you know, your brain goes to the worst places, right? And I think staying really positive throughout the whole thing, and that sounds very cliche, I know, but like, I do think that a lot of, of how a diagnosis of any sort, whether it was my paralysis or my bladder cancer, it, it impacts you. You get to frame it, you know, however you choose to frame it. It takes a minute because you can die. That's the first thing you think of. I was like, I could, I could die. Like what? Um, but kind of, yeah, remaining, um, remaining positive. I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of data to show the connection between a positive mental attitude and a good outcome. It's not, you know, it's not the cure all, um, but it sure doesn't hurt. I guess being a social worker, I would say uh, the mental health piece of it is might require some counseling. Um, like you shouldn't be afraid to reach out for that as well. See what your, your, benefits have to offer like through work or again through the, the mention other mentioned things like the social worker honestly I learned a lot in the waiting room from other people waiting for treatment um that was how I learned I could get the BCG in Baton Rouge probably not from anyone else which I mean I guess my doctor mentioned it early on but I was I was thinking the best thing for me was like a cancer center, center of excellence but also talk to people in the waiting room. I can be, they could probably been doing it. They may have done it for years and, and really know the ropes. This isn't easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that you can choose to pout about it. My father said, this is when I got shot. I said, I'm, I'm like, this is not fair. Like I'm a good girl. I was kind of a rule follower, scared to death of my parents and just kind of just a good kid. And he said that fair was for games like Monopoly and that he never told me life was going to be fair. And I was like, okay, well, that sucks. But I was, but it does put it in perspective, right? It's like, okay, bad things are going to happen and all you can do is really make the best of it. Like I'm just bound and determined not to let life get me down.